work has been an absolute inspiration for you, the Bard, so we'll have a while. And in many ways, all of our best ideas are stolen from him, which you hadn't known until tonight, and so maybe I should have told you that. <laughs> um, I, um, I have uh, sort of been aware of Jim's work for a number of years. Um, I um, use Twitter a lot, as some of you may know. And um, Jim ran a, uh, a, a still, there's ongoing, a really famous MOOC, connected to this MOOC, called DS-106, Digital Storytelling 106. And um, this uh, took place across a lot of platforms. It's uh, a, really a course that's more like a community of people who interact and work together and create really interesting media. Um, DS-106 describes itself as part storytelling workshop, part technology training, and most importantly, part critical education in the digital landscape that is ever increasingly mediating how we communicate with one another. It's a, it's a really fascinating community of people. And now that I've made it sound really fascinating and said this is how I first got to know Jim, I have to admit, I've never taken it. <laughs> but here's the weird part, my students have taken little bits of it. Because DS-10, oh, and some of you are sitting right here. <laughs> right? Um, DS-106 is an open community of educators and they share all the resources online, educators and everybody, participants. And I have stolen and remixed um, assignments from there. They are my very best ideas on them. It's a really interesting group. And it is really a course that is a community. That's the thing that I like about it most. Um, and that is a value that we hold deeply here at your College, right? It's the first of our four C's. And I think that sort of process, that connectivist uh, approach to teaching is I think, absolutely um, something we can learn from here at Whittier to do digitally as well as we already do in our sort of liberal arts world, you know, sitting under a tree in the grass, you know, reading deeply in um, um, Walt Whitman or something like that, just to mention one of my favorite practices. <laughs> so um, although I haven't taken DS 106, I've been, in, I've been sort of surrounded by people who have been influenced by it, and um, it has sort of launched, I think, the need for um, what Gardner Campbell called a personal cyber infrastructure. Okay? That is, as we start to produce a lot more and more media objects all across the web, we want to have some kind of control over where those are going, over our own data, and over our own digital online presence. Okay? And Jim now is offering to colleges and universities across the country um, the opportunity to provide for our students, for faculty and staff, this um, means of taking control of their online digital identity very inexpensively. Um, so, uh, Whittier College has just become the most recent of a very, shall we say, elite few colleges who offer to all of our campus members um, the opportunity to host their own website. Many of you were in the workshop yesterday, so I don't need to tell you how cool that was. Um, but I just want to say one final word as I'm introducing Jim, which is there are two screens back here which I realize probably very few people can see, but what's on them, and Jim can't see them, What's on them is a Twitter back channel. If you are a Twitter user, feel free to please tweet to the hashtag. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag outside dig live arts. We try to use that for all of our events. And uh, a number of us will be live tweeting, that is taking notes basically of things that are <coughs> interesting that he says, maybe things we disagree with. That's possible. <laughs> um, but also questions that we might have. So please, if you have questions, um, tweet them into the hashtag into the channel. Watch it on the screen to see what other people in the audience are thinking about. And after his talk, we'll have an opportunity to bring those to the fore in live discussion. Okay? So, Dig Live Arts is the hashtag for the talk. So, with all of that, I, on behalf of Dig Live Arts, of Sonia Chidas, and Hobbit, <coughs> and all of the steering committee for Dig Live Arts, I want to welcome Jim Grimm. going to try something a little bit new. I was at, let's see, before I start talking, I'll just make sure that works. Okay, so while that's working, one of the things I'm going to be experimenting with today with my talk is actually interesting because it's in many ways grounded in this space, or at least LA, is I'm going to be talking about some of the early experiments, some of which Andrea mentioned, um, with a group in University of Mary Washington in Virginia. 
um, from about 2004 up until recently, uh, where we had been kind of doing what we have been fashioning as independent ed tech. Independent ed tech, this idea where you can actually create these cheap, independent models for teaching and learning that can be sustainable with very cheap commodity level hosting. So alternatives to the big learning management systems that are really expensive. And my attempt is to make that parallel with punk rock in the 80s. Now you could use hip hop if you wanted, you could pick your analogy. I'm gonna actually use a book um, written recently by Michael, not recently, about a decade and a half ago by Michael Azarath, Azarath called Our Bank of the Year. And so this book actually takes a look at 12 to 15 bands from all over the US that created an independent music scene. And it's not because they all were the same kind of band. It's because they all had a particular ethos to how they produced and what they produced. And their production was often very cheap, meaning they did it on the low. They created a real network of people all over the US, which were alternative bookings, like um, spaces that we would think of now as kind of legendary, one of them which was in downtown LA called Jabber Club, um, which is now gone, was a small coffee shop that was an independent um, music venue in the late 80s and 90s. And so it talks about this whole network of people. And I'm going to look at that in relationship to education and technology and see if there is a parallel. Luckily, I have slides that I can turn to while I kind of bought a little bit of time there. Um, so I'm going to start, though, not there. I'm going to start here. And hence the title of my talk, um, A Very Short Anatomy. And this didn't make everyone happy. 
particularly this guy. This is Lars Ulrich of Metallica, right? You would think badass heavy metal Metallica wouldn't have a problem with people maybe taking a couple of songs. Lars Ulrich was actually in front of um, the Senate, I believe it was, arguing why Napster, he had actually had a lawsuit, but arguing why Napster was such a terrible idea. And I'm going to read a quick quote from Stephen Johnson, who I'll talk about in a second, who's describing kind of nostalgically this moment in musical history when it comes to the digital. And I'm going to quote here. Ulrich's trip to Washington coincided with a lawsuit that Metallica had just filed against Lapster, Napster. <laughs> a suit that would ultimately play a role in the company's bankruptcy filing. But in retrospect, we can also see Ulrich's appearance as an intellectual milestone of sorts, in that he articulated a critique of the internet era creative economy that became increasingly commonplace over time. We typically, and this is, I'm quoting now, Lars Ulrich, we typically employ a record producer, record engineers, programmers, assistants, and occasionally other musicians. Ulrich told the Senate Committee. We rent time for months at recording studios which are owned by small businessmen who have risked their own capital to buy, maintain, and constantly upgrade very expensive equipment and facilities. Our record releases are supported by hundreds of records of companies' employees and provided programming for numerous radio and television stations. It's clear then that if music is free for downloading, the music industry is not viable. All the jobs I just talked about will be lost and the diverse voices of the artists disappear. It's a really big platform for Lars Ulrich, not only famous for his music with Metallica, he's the drummer, but also for this kind of defending of the music industry, which is in the grips of complete disruption and falling apart. So, just this August, Stephen Johnson went ahead and he did, it was August 19, 2005, he did an analysis, a retrospective analysis of was Lars Ulrich right? Is the music industry a mess? Right? Has it collapsed because of this free downloading or the changing nature of the medium? And it's interesting what they found. In 2000, the top 100 tours right, took in 90% of all revenues. So the biggest artists were, were, had the hugest part of the market. Fifteen years later, the top 100 tours had 43% of the revenue. Which means, right, that the other 57%, if my math is right, it's probably wrong, 47%, I know there's math, but 47%, 47%, have been distributed, right? <laughs> Potentially independently across the whole community. Now let's look at this from 2002 to 2012. Doing some interesting kind of numbers analysis. The number of businesses that identify as or employ independent artists, writers, and performers has grown 40%. Right? Total revenue for these independent artists has gone up 60%. So rather than the kind of apocalyptic disruption Lars Ulrich was talking about in 2001 or 2000, we saw actually a diversification of the market and more possibilities for more independent artists. And one of the things that's interesting to me particularly, and so as Adam, and this is Adam's presentation that I'm giving in some ways, at least these first slides, is talking about this notion that Markov talks about, is to understand a particular culture, and this culture, Silicon Valley in the 60s, which a lot of people don't realize was premised as much on LSD and free love <laughs> as it was on any computer engineering technical reality is a really interesting moment. So I was thinking, what if we looked, thinking about what Lars Ulrich had to say about the music industry and the kind of the frame around that music industry, what if we look at punk rock in the 80s, right? And punk rock has a longer history than the 80s, right? In fact, in the late 70s, you would think, and I pick punk rock because I'm particularly interested in punk rock, but you can do the same with a lot of different music. Right? You could do hip hop. You could look at um, folk. You could look at a whole bunch of different genres. Punk rock is interesting to me because by 1981, the moment that this book starts chronicling, people would argue that punk rock was dead. Right? The Ramones, The Clash, Blondie, etc. Like they had their heyday. Like they made their impact. 
right? And the scene was kind of somewhat dynamic. Or perceived perception, you could argue probably around it. The argument that Michael Azraz makes is actually at that moment is where you get a kind of resurgence of a whole new scene of quote unquote punk. What punk is becomes something that he tries to argue and think about throughout the book. But what he suggests, and this is what I'm interested in, is that's unique to a time and place historically. And the time and place, which I think is wonderful, given where I'm giving this presentation, and given that when I walk in the Whittier Library, I'm surrounded by punk paraphernalia, right? There was punk photographs, right? Tonight, we have um, the lead singer for TSOL who's going to be lecturing after this. And I'm just fascinated by, like, you know, LA, sunny LA, you know, suburban apocalypse LA of the 80s was the setting for the beginning of this independent punk scene. And we'll talk about Black Play in a second. But this is a quote from Michael Azarad's book, The Beginning, when he's kind of setting up this moment of this new scene. It's not surprising that the indie movement largely started in Southern California. After all, it had the infrastructure. Slash and Flipside fanzine started in 1977, and indie labels like Frontier, Posh Boy, and Danger House started soon afterwards. K-Rock DJ Rodney Bigenheimer played the region's punk music on a show. Listeners could buy what they had heard thanks to various area distributors and record shops and see the bands at places like The Mask, The Starwood, The Whiskey, The Fleetwood, and various impromptu venues. And there were great bands like The Germs, Fear, The Dickies, The Dills, X, and countless others. No other region in the country had quite as good a setup, but by 1979, the original punk scene had almost completely died out. Hipsters had moved on to arty post-punk bands like The Fall, Gang of Four, and Joy Division. They were replaced by a bunch of toughs coming in from Alpine suburbs who were only beginning to discover punk's speed, power, and aggression. They didn't care that punk rock was already being dismissed as a spent force. Kids fans playing at being the remote a few years too late. And he sets up a kind of moment after punk had kind of hit where you have a city like LA, and we'll look at different cities all across the country as a result of the different bands that we feature in this presentation, at a kind of moment where the punk ethos gets transformed by bands and individuals like Greg Dinn and Black Flag and the Minutemen into a kind of philosophy, into an ethos. And that ethos and philosophy for me is really interesting in terms of framing that movement as well as what I think an ed tech movement could be and should be. So there's my philosophy. There's my hypothesis. It took a while, but I got it. Let's start with Black Flag. So Black Flag was among the first bands to suggest that if you didn't like the system, replace it. Build your own, right? And one of the things that was great about Black Flag is they did that. They built their own record label. They built the whole entire scene, right? Greg Ginn was really influential even before he had started his own record label. He had actually created a kind of stereophonics zine that was extremely popular. So it was kind of do-it-yourself guru. He brought on a singer who was kind of one of the most famous icons of punk in that day, Henry Rollins. Right? Henry Rollins became this tattooed, some of you probably know Henry Rollins, really muscular, really in your face. He's got that weird neck that seems to be like that long, and always like sinewy. Um, and he kind of became the icon of this movement, as did Black Flag. Like, Black Flag kind of started what people would call the indie hardcore moment. And one of the things that is interesting is I kind of liken a group that's not very punk rock at all. Right? In fact, we're almost the opposite of punk rock in that this is a group at Mary Washington, uh, a group I've been a part of, I just left a month ago, um, that started in 2004 to Actually, we were supporting a system. We were supporting Blackboard, a learning management system. And for those of you who don't want to get caught up too much in the, in the terminology, learning management systems became the default space where we would do our teaching and learning. They were kind of a closed, encapsulated space where you couldn't really express or do teaching and learning beyond the pure exchange model. So the idea here was to actually build something else. And so in 2004, we did. We created an alternative system where we had our own domains, our own web hosting. Sound familiar? 
And we actually started playing with open source technologies and building alternative infrastructure. We built a media wiki, which was the same technology they were using to build Wikipedia. We started playing with WordPress very early on. We started playing with our own forums, our own means of kind of communicating and building a collaborative community for our university. There were six of us. We each had our own domain and web hosting. It cost us about $6 a month, which is extremely affordable. And so it was a kind of, for me, very much likened to this kind of alternative infrastructure. Now, punk wasn't just limited, though, to the kind of heavy, at least the 80s punk, heavy, somewhat violent orientated black flag, right? You also had another band, in some ways radically different. This is a band from Boston, Massachusetts. This is Mission Burma. And one of the things about Mission Burma that was interesting is, unlike, you know, the dark, um, somewhat emo uh, black flag, which would kind of deal with the, the darkest psyche moments, these were completely kind of like art band, right? They were very much fascinated by John Cage. They were fascinated by intellectual problems, but they also did anthemic rock, right? And so they only lasted for about two or three years, but this was a band that other bands, as they came after them, would refer back to as this experimental band. They had one of their bandmates, which I think is great, which was never on stage. His name was Martin Swope. And what he would do is he would actually do the tape effects. He would actually cut and paste in different effects into the music. So he was actually kind of like um, a DJ for their music or an effects master for their music. And I thought it was interesting that a punk rock band in 1981, 82, was experimenting with these effects. Um, very few examples I could think of like that. Really interesting. And that's kind of, in some ways, another moment with Mary Washington. We had all these open source applications. We aren't limited by a system. We have to do this kind of teaching and learning in this kind of space. We actually had a whole range of different applications to pull from. So what did we start to do? We started to mash up wikis with blogs. We started to create infrastructure that wasn't limited to one system, right? It didn't necessarily have to scale to thousands of people. We could also start to give faculty and students their own spaces, which opened up some interesting questions, right? And one of the things that opens up when you start to do this kind of experimentation is how do you control this, right? How do you frame that message? How do you kind of build a kind of community of experimentation that's sustainable. And one of the great examples, I think, this is a punk band from DC. As you see now, we moved from LA to Boston and now down to DC. This is Minor Threat. Some of you may or may not recognize the gentleman in the front, Ian Mackay. He's kind of a, a legend now of the independent punk scene. Uh, he went on to be a part of Fugazi and many other things. And Mackay is interesting, or McKay, I don't want to say McKay, but I think it's Mackay. What's interesting about him is he had this hardcore philosophy. It was another take on the punk scene. Don't drink, don't smoke, be upright, but be pissed off, right? <laughs> like, it was kind of, and he was in your face. He was also in DC, so they were reacting against the Reagan movies, which were very entrenched, right? And he was also actually a figure who was pretty remarkable. He built his own record label, like Black Flag. His was called Discord and it's a record label that's still very much going strong. And what Minor Threat became for the DC community, inspired by bands like Bad Brains and the like, it became a cultural hub. They had a house they called the Discord House. And that's where artists and people came and where they would have their own kind of you know, communities. And bands would come in, and it was interesting to me because you start to see the punk thing is not just a mohawk and a leather jacket. It's these different cultural centers around the country that are starting to frame what their identity is, what their culture is, and what they're reacting to. I think Azarad does a good job of starting to bring this out. So at Mary Washington, what we did in about 2007, so the experiment started in 2004, 2007 we had actually built an enterprise system. So through our kind of $6 a month experimentation, we built something called UW Blogs, which is a platform that any faculty and every student can get their own site and build on top of. It was an alternative to the LMS, or Learning Management System, and it was something that we had mad success with. So in a matter of a year and a half, we had 3,000 people on our community on it. 
We have a 4,000 person community. And the thing is, is it wasn't like we were mad geniuses. It wasn't like we were kind of special. There were no alternatives for community to publish. The only ones they could use in 2007 were off campus. Blogger, WordPress.com, you name it. So in fact, there was actually a parent that there was a need for people to express themselves and create, there just wasn't the space. 2008, this thing happened, which actually started as a joke, to some degree, called EduCon. And I actually was part of it, right? A friend of mine, well, in an office, we playing on, you know, um, the famous love and hate on, I forget his name right now, 1955 film. Anyone want to help me out? Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum. Now, Kate Fear, um, he plays the, the demented um, reverend. And loves the battle and hate, and then hate's going to win. And then actually, okay, I'll come back to it. But then Spike Lee <laughs> uses it again and do the right thing. I'll come back. I'll remember. Um, so it was a play on that. It was a special edge of I put out this picture, I wrote a post kind of talking about why are we using these established systems for teaching and learning when we can build our own and create our own networks of learning. And isn't that what we do in higher ed? Well, it kind of caught on in a small sort of way where people got excited and thought it was an alternative to many of the systems in which, as universities, we were being pushed in. And there was also this, I think, this rhetoric underneath there that was powerful is, you know, we were denaturing ourselves from the very technology that we had created in the 60s and 70s. Universities like UCLA, University of Utah, Stanford, etc., part and parcel of building the protocols for the network that has become the web. And yet, at the same time, we were buying these packaged solutions and selling them to our community without any sense of a kind of broader notion of where we spent, where we kind of occupy the role of creation and participation in that community and that technology. And so there was a struggle there. So unlike edgy punk per se, not all punk bands are even conceived of as punk bands. Azerat includes another band from the 80s. And this one is The Replacement. Let's move to another part of the US. This time we go to Minneapolis Twin Cities, right? Twin Tom Records. And Replacements, a lot of people when you talk about The Replacements, don't even think of them necessarily as punk, right? They have long hair, so that happened. Who's could do and other bands started to refuse the idea that you needed to have short hair or a mohawk and a leather jacket to be punk. They started to grow out their hair. They actually created these really ballad-like, you know, hard on your sleeve lyrics, right? And they were kind of poppy, but whenever they played live, they were completely drunk. They would not play any of their own songs. They'd only play covers. They were completely shoot themselves in the foot, right? And a lot of people associated that kind of um, suicidal tendency on their part in terms of getting any kind of success to be very punk rock, right? But, you know, the replacements, even after the fact, I mean, they're touring now and they're as good as they've ever been, um, really kind of were on the edge between what people would accept as punk or not as punk. Yet they also lived a kind of almost a mock of what the rock and roll life was, right? Their whole band was kind of mocking that idea of the big rock and roll, let's make it big. And that, for many people, was interesting. And I think for us at Mary Washington, as we follow from our own experiment with Bluehost to building a platform, we had a platform that was UMW Plus, and it gave people their own spaces. But we needed to push beyond it. If we believe in 2004 that giving us as instructional technologists our own web and domain to build stuff was radical, at what point could we do that with our own cameras? Everything. And so 2010 comes around, and we have this idea for a class. And this is a class that's probably the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. It's called DS-106. I'm going to talk about it. And why was it cool? It was cool because it started as a 25-person class at Mary Washington. We all got together, we all got our own domains of web hosting, and we built from the ground a network of students who all managed their own space and built around that space. Well, what happened the next semester is a bunch of people from online who were following the class, because we did a lot of the stuff openly and online, said, look, I love the fact that you guys built your own domains of web hosting. Can we take your class to do that? And this is 
free movement. People call it a pro movement. But since 2011, before that 200,000 Stanford AI class kind of chained higher ed, um, it was interesting because people just wanted to sit and see how we did the main stuff and then leave. So the following spring, we opened up the class for that. 500 people took the class. But rather than being interested in domains, they all got interested in animated gifts. They all got interested in creating this fascinating culture around art and the science. One of the things that came out of it that I think is quote unquote an Azure term maybe pump is that one of the assignment, the idea behind the assignments is it's not a faculty driven reality. We have an assignment bank that students populate. And you do the student, you do the assignments that are cool. And so the, and I'll put mine in there right alongside the students, and maybe mine will be done more than the student. And I was pretty cocky when I first ran this class. I was like, my assignments are like the 10 commandments of assignments. Like these are the assignments. Students started to put in assignments from all over the place. One of the students put in an assignment called the poetry playlist. And I always thought this was such a stupid assignment, right? Take your, your playlist from iTunes or Media Player or wherever, and you look through the titles of your songs and you make a poem. Right? I was like, no one's going to do that. She came in Tuesday, and I was joking with her about this. <coughs> Thursday, 60 people from all over the world had done her poetry playlist and had actually posted it. And it was interesting because at that moment, I realized we were in a completely different ecosystem of creating and my relationship to what they do and how they do it and their relationship to participating. So DS-106 for us was an actual trial run for what it meant to build a participatory DIY ethos for not only ed tech, but for our specific classroom. And it was really, for me, um, we even taught the class as fake people. So I shaved my head, I shaved what little I have left, I shaved this, I had just a mustache, and I came on and taught a class for five weeks as Dr. Libby, which was a reference to Cronenberg's video drone, Dr. Brian Oblivion, who actually had never been face to face with anyone for 25 years. He had only been mediated through the TV. So I said, why don't I only be mediated through the internet and teach a class entirely as Dr. Oblivion? Thing is, with digital identity, is it's a tricky business. Three days in, I really had identity problems. My kids were calling me Dr. Oblivion. My <laughs> wife wouldn't sleep in the same bed as me. I was really like alienated. And so I was like, I can't do it. Put on a hat, put on my glasses, back. And what my group and I who were working on this said, well, why don't we have Dr. Oblivion go missing? Getting kidnapped. And so people all over the country started to make kidnap signs, posters, because it's about design stuff and Dr. Oblivion. They were posted in the New York subway. And this whole world emerged out of this alternative universe through a community that was literally international of people creating. And this is a class that's still going on. It takes on different themes at different times. Less than or two semesters ago, we did more. We did Wire, the TV show by David Simon. So we'll theme base it, but it's a distributed open class that I think has a lot of the communal <coughs> elements of how I think of the early network of this independent punk scene. Probably the godfathers in some ways of this DIY we Jam Akano Ethos is a local band from San Pedro, Dominican. Mike walked in, in the middle of Dee Boone, the kind of famous combination of this class, I mean of this band. And one of the things they do that I think is really interesting is they were, they were there to theorize and they were very kind of mindful of the change that was happening in the culture of punk at the time. And so they were really kind of instrumental in being mindful of moving all their own music, booking all their own tours, you know, setting up their own uh, instruments, and then bre breaking them down. Stuff that seems relatively simple, but stuff that meant a lot. Building communities not only with the folks up in Black Flag because they were connected, but all over the place. And it's interesting that, you know, Watt and Boone kind of frame, they say, and I'll show you the video, they kind of note this idea of Regia McConnell. And Lee Jamakano became the kind of, how would I say it, the slogan of DS-106. DS-106 is a distributed course supporting thousands of students. That costs us about 25 bucks a month per month. I think that's a very interesting relationship to building these versus these tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars of MOOCs that are produced at these Ivy Leagues. 
And what this is focusing on, DS-106, is the experience of teaching and learning through technology. Not the kind of, I don't know, reification of the lecture as video. Right? And I don't think lectures are necessarily bad. But I think when you build an industry around pre-producing that, replacing an experience between people, it's really problematic. So there was that kind of um, under undercurrent to DS-106 and all the work that we went. We get finally, I know, I like the talks, we get finally to a project that you all have access to. This is 2012. <laughs> Two years after DS-106, we ran that trial. It was wildly successful. We said, why couldn't we give all 4,000 students and faculty and admin access to their own domain web hosting at We did. So 2013, we ran a pilot with 400. It worked. We opened it up in 2013, and for the last two years, we've been offering anyone who's interested in their own web hosting and um, their own domain. Why? And that's a bigger question, right? Like, cool that you can do it. But why would you do it? And I think my argument to why was answered by some people in this room who I talked to before the presentation. What platforms do we have right now to help our students understand and interrogate the web? What platforms do we have for visual literacy? Is that Moodle, right? Is that your uh, CMS, right? Where does that happen? And traditionally for the last 10 years, we've allowed that stuff to go external. We've allowed that to happen on Blogger, on Twitter, and all these places, and that's fine. But increasingly, we have more and more concerns, not only about trying to capture our community and promote that community from within, which is a good thing, but also about how many of these monolithic silo sites that have all your information are trustworthy. How much can you depend on your information being there? And if you can, do you at least understand how they're using your information to sell you? as a problem, right? Is that conscious? Are you conscious of that? Is that something we should be talking about as a university? <laughs> we did it at UMW. Very soon, I'm going to step off the stage for a second. Very soon after, Emory University was interested in that. They wanted to do it. But they don't want to do it like we did it. They wanted to have all of their first year writing students get their own domain and have their own portfolio. And so immediately, what domains of one's own were shifting, depending upon the context, right? And you had a whole bunch of freshmen at Emory having their own writing portfolio based on their name that they would share, right? And I don't know how many of you know this. This is Flaming Lips. This is an homage to Adam Crew, who I mentioned to earlier. This is another independent band, kind of a psychedelic, um, I don't know if you would argue, kind of multi-layered uh, rock band from Oklahoma City. Yet another space within the map of indie punk or indie music. And I reference them because Oklahoma, which is a huge public, <coughs> research, our one research, research university said, we want to try this. And we want to try it to give our faculty and students space so they can do other stuff with WordPress, Omega, Scalar, etc. But we also want to replace the spaces that we got rid of, these tilde spaces that no one was being supported in. So they built an infrastructure to support 2,000 the first year, up to 4,000 now, for faculty, students, and admin to build and create their own spaces. We also have some pretty experimental. This is Sonic Youth, the kind of no way band with kind of hardcore, like classical guitar, or at least a hard guard guitar that becomes kind of one of the leaders of, of, of punk um, in, the, in the 80s, they kind of known for their experimentation. And what we started to see, and this is interesting, a university in Australia, Charles Sturt University, brought us some really interesting questions. They wanted a platform where their students could experiment wildly, build whatever they want, as long as that. But they didn't want it on US servers. And you'll always hear this now, from if you go, once you go outside of the US, space. It's like, is it on US servers? I want no part. Because, you know, we live in the post-Snowden era, right? And what was interesting is this is actually an example of EdTech, or the domain of one's own, repurposed internationally on their own servers in their own context. So taking what was happening here and refashioning it 
for their own community and experimenting with it wildly. One of my favorite examples, and this is my last example of the kind of 80s uh, punk, is an interesting one. How many of you here have heard of a band called Be Happy? Any? Interesting. So this is probably, I would argue, one of the most influential bands of the 80s. Period. And no one's heard of them, which I think is fascinating. Um, Be Happening, uh, there were early leaders in what we would consider like American indie pop and lo-fi, right? They would do primitive recordings, they would just bang on some drums or some tables, and they, these, none of them could play any instruments. But they had, they incorporated, and this was somewhat unique, Kim Gordon was in Sonic Youth, Heather Lewis was playing every instrument in Be Happening, right? And Be Happening was a band that was premised on this notion of returning to this coy, teenage logic. They built their own record label, K Records. Calvin Johnson was really kind of like the figurehead of this whole movement. And he was a very powerful figurehead at that. And it was in Olympia, right? So when you think of Olympia, what do you think of? You think of the Riot Girls, right? You think of Bikini Kill. You think of Nirvana, right? I mean, this is part, this is part of where um, Kurt Cobain was influenced by a whole community of this independent scene by Calvin Johnson. But what they premised is we don't like the whole violent, hardcore nature of Henry Rollins and the like, right? We want our punk rockers to be nerds and guardians, right? We want a whole different vision of punk rock. And it was one of the things over that decade that kind of opened up the concept of punk was more about this independent, lo-fi, self-sufficient movement towards building a community and a sense of purpose and independence, rather than one look, one style, one philosophy, one approach. And I really like the way in which Azarad in his book made this broader argument. And for me, I also think that's ideally what would happen with universities who would start to experiment with the main of one's own. A university like Davidson, who early on got onto domains, kind of built this around student projects. The domain became a kind of incubator for students' work, for class work, for building around ideas of what was happening in that community and promoting it, right? It became their platform to promote the community and the independent projects happening there, right? BYU is an interesting example altogether. BYU not only wanted to build the domain, they wanted to build an entire infrastructure where they could connect every student. So what BYU wanted to do, and I thought this was interesting, is they wanted every student who was coming to BYU, say as early as the age of 14 or 15, to have a domain. And from that domain, be able to share every bit of information that that university needed from their personal domain. So their vision is this. You have your transcripts from high school, you have your particular records and all this on your own space, and you decide what we can share and what we can see. You're in control of sharing that stuff from your own space. And that's a digital node of the network. So they're using the domain of one's own to think more broadly about archiving presence and archiving an individual presence. And it's not a mistake, because they're, of the, they're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they are insane about genealogy. This is extremely important in terms of tracking relationships. So they think that every individual should be in charge of those digital artifacts that make up who they are. So it's really very much in line with their philosophy. And I found it very interesting in the way they're thinking about it far more broadly. This is actually, I will play it now in respect for time, or I'll play the first 30 seconds, because it's interesting. This is Mike Watt, Mike Watt talking about this whole regen economy. And you know, his mother, this idea where you make up your own uh, entertaining, your own activities, I think it was really intense on us, you know, this whole idea of DIY and stuff. Uh, I guess there's a debate over this, you know, you want things for young people to do so they don't get in gangs and in trouble like this. But if things are too set up and stuff, you end up uh, running a bunch of 
treating an army of robots anyway, you know? There's, there comes a period when you're going to have to come up and do things, you know, become your own person, your own, your own friends. You know, guys run, you know, build dreams with and stuff. Big change in my life. Big deal. Our man can be your life. This is them doing a public access TV show, pretty much unplugged, right? They're all playing uh, their, their instruments. There's no kind of, um, they're, they're mic'd, but they're not electric. And we'll see the explosion of that in the 90s when Nirvana does their unplugged and then MTV does the whole unplugged series. But more than that, there's this kind of acknowledgement by Watt and by the Minutemen and by this community on this notion of the DIY, on the importance of building these communities and doing this stuff yourself. And the question I think it begs is how much are we empowering our communities to do this stuff ourselves? How much of this is brought by predefined systems that allow for little to no experimentation and possibility? And how much of it is sandboxes that we're building and enabling for a broader community of people to use and build upon? Now, I want to kind of end by not suggesting that um, this is something unique to you. And I think one of the mistakes I made in, in Stanford, and it was because I had much less time, so I, I don't think I was intentional, but we're not alone in this. So um, this stuff has been done by other people, and it's being done by other people. One of the great things, I went to UC Irvine two summers ago, and I got to see the work of FemTechNet. FemTechNet is a distributed community of faculty and students who are doing something very similar, right? They're disrupting traditional modes of how we understand community based on the web. They are kind of intervening in the kind of um, gender-based or biases of Wikipedia by doing something they call the Wikistorm. And it's a really interesting distributed community of faculty and students who also are somewhat headless, which I think is one of the coolest things. Like, one of the problems, I think, with the S106 is so many people associated with me. It would actually be cool if they did it. And I think FemTechNet did this beautifully. They actually distributed it so power is always moving around the community. And I think that's a lot to learn, that kind of distributed sense of community and power. And the folks at FemTechNet are doing that. Another one is a British course called Phono, which is a photography course, which is done entirely online through a hashtag, Phono. And it's a really powerful global network of photographers who take time to show other people how to take photographs. And it's a really powerful community of people helping people. And I love these examples of alternative ways of thinking through teaching and learning. The other thing is, two individuals who actually usually live here in Los Angeles, um, Audrey Waters and Ken Lane, they're really influential. One of the things they've been pushing hard on is thinking more about how your personal data is akin to oil. Right? The new oil is your personal data. That's what's being mined. Right? Networks of information are what's being mined. I saw a slide the other day and I found it interesting. How can the biggest kind of house renting agency and taxi company in the world, Airbnb and um, uh, Uber not own any cars or homes. Isn't that fascinating? The biggest infrastructure for basically hotels and taxis, and they don't, they own none. It's all about the network. The fact that they own the network and the means of communicating is far more important than the actual physical capital. And that's actually, I think, a broader shift right now in how we have to understand our relationship as universities to networks. Because part of what I'm thinking about with this Indian tech, and I hope I'm not beating the horse too much, is in the 80s you had this network of culture happening around the globe, and specifically around the US, in these different locations that were connected. And by connecting in the cross hybrid of these ideas, they became more powerful. How are we as universities using these networks for creation through the web to actually enhance what we're doing? I've I got to believe in my heart of hearts that's more than sharing do. I, I have to believe that's really about connecting us across these institutions in meaningful ways. Or outside of it. Or in spite of it. Right? I mean, that was what Craig Ginn said, right? 
right? If the system's not working for you, build an alternative one outside. And I think that's a powerful idea. Now, this also comes in relationship to a broader sweep we have right now in our culture. And this is an interesting audio. I'll play it to you briefly. Uh, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, in 2004, made a video before we had YouTube. And the video was about how our personal information would be used in 2015, which is interesting, right? 11 years. So I'm going to play this video to you quickly. And this is a video of someone ordering a pizza in 2015. Pizza Palace, here if you have 30 minutes or to free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly. And yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you with a 736 Montrose Corporate. You're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Mount Lotus Supply. Send up 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No. I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh. Well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high nice blood pressure. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future plans of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery at Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could pay $48 if you ordered our special spread submarine combo if you set yourself. Comes with tofu sticks, so they're very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets from Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bar at the library last week. Up to you, sir. Right, right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that weight if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. <laughs> Man, I'd say cocoa and sprouts is like required. That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness Magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? <laughs> Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Want to stop this from happening? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, in 2005, like, 2005, 2004, and we're saying this, and it seems, well, okay, you know, that's funny, that too. I don't know, like, how do you feel about that now? Like, in 2015, Coach Snowden, Coach Snowden, I don't know if we think that that's what we say of a vision, right? I mean, in fact, we know that people have access to a light of our data and that our government is intentionally mining our data. That's a wild, that puts that video, I think, 11 years later, ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, was right on. <laughs> That's a real concern, and it's a deep concern. And it's the elephant in the room. And I brought up Snowden several times, but it's interesting just to listen to a quick bit from him in a recent um, article, in a recent uh, video interview he did, um, just to hear about how we Only Wendy's makes a deal. Feel like a meal. I don't think that's what I want to hear about. I do have it. Americans, uh, NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can by any means possible. But it believes on the grounds of sort of self certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now, increasingly, we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system, and it filters them, and it analyzes them, and it measures them, and it stores them for periods of time, simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, 
be intending to uh, target some of the socially informed government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst? Interesting, because, I mean, I think if we're going to talk about paranoia and crackpots in the States, I mean, we would all turn to Snowden. But I don't think Snowden has been seen as that. I mean, he's a whistleblower, he might be considered. Um, by many to be an enemy of the state, depending upon how you look at that. But at the end of the day, here's a person who's basically laid bare the fact that what we think in 2004 could happen is happening. And I think where domains comes in, and it comes in a lot of different frames, but one of the ways it comes in, if we think about what defines our cultural moment, is how do we respond? How do we control and manage our own spaces and our own data, hopefully, so that the NSA pulling across all these major sites, Amazon, Apple, Twitter, Flickr, you name it, right? Um, Facebook, Verizon. How do we stand outside of it? Some ways, that seems impossible, right? But in other ways, I think those alternative networks that I think the 80s pump seem Highlights is a fascinating kind of at least stepping off point for a moment where whether domains is just about having an alternative sandbox or it's about thinking critically about the state of our culture and our relationship to power. It has that wide a spectrum for me. And it's why I think it's actually really compelling and interesting model to start introducing to students. But is it something as practical? To deeply, deeply political and conceptual. And okay, I'm in the frame. Okay. With that, I actually want to just take the last moment to suggest that. How is this used? And so the bottom line with the domains, and this is what we found at UMW, and this is what we found more broadly across universities. Is not only is it used, and this is a particular student side of Mary Washington, who went on to get her master's at Penn State, art, and this became her art portfolio, which she framed it. And we have other spaces for our faculty who do something similar, right? So we have this, this is two of our faculty who built their entire presence, whether it be their courses, their blog, all of that, through these spaces, which is pretty impressive. But I think the bigger question, and I'll end with this one, because this is by a student at Davidson. Asking, is do we own our domains? Like by doing this institutionally at WIDI or at UMW or wherever, are we really empowering our faculty and students? Right? Is this really for it to be relevant, for it to be adequate? I think it also has to help us rethink how we teach, how we learn, what our relationship is in that exchange. And Andrew Rickard, who's a student at um, Davidson, wrote an article with EduSearch, and I highly recommend you look it up if you're interested in more about this, really challenging the very premise of it. Saying that unless this is a space where faculty and students are free to build and create, then this is a space that is like every other technology that came before. Here's my assignment. Here's what's expected to move on. And I think I would talk as much about the technology and the networks, but so much of the success of something like this has everything to do with the community and the culture and why you're using it. And so I think, to end, I would just highly, as you're going down this and as you're experimenting with it, and it should be an experimentation, think about like what it means in relationship to what you want to do, to your teaching, to your space as a student. Does it offer something that kind of helps you rethink some basic premises, undergirding how we communicate, how we empower our faculty and students to build their own presence, to manage and control their own life. I don't know. I think at that point where it does, I think we start to see a broader shift in an ethos, a culture change, which I think for me is the real thing that interests me about the main one. Though. The technology is fascinating, but it's completely retro. And I've said this a couple of times. It's old technology. It's been around since 2002, 2003. I'm not here selling you anything new and shiny. It's actually something that has been around, have universities have, in general, not engaged 
for all the possible problems that come with it. But at the same time, I think, have missed a completely fascinating sandbox of sharing and building for their communities and beyond. And it's starting to come back around in some kind of basic way. How we use it, though, and what we do with it will be the difference. That said, is there any questions about any of that? The punk rock metaphor? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you say something about how you see objects like uh, Tor and Lent and Crypt um, and how they're going to play a role in this sort of letting people take control of their own identity and take control of their information gets out there? I think Let's Encrypt in particular is something we're really waiting for because you can do that, but it costs money. And the thing about, and this is what, it's a, it's a really fair and good criticism of this stuff, is what's winning out always is convenience, right? What can wins out, why Facebook wins out, why Twitter, why all these places? Because it's convenient, it's easy, people are there. And so you can't, it would be disingenuous to say, come to my silo and do my stuff in your own domain, but there's no one else there, right? It's like, you know, uh, the last individual on Earth was riding into a void. Um, so those spaces, those, those spaces have real value. The idea of protecting it, though, has become at a cost. Let's encrypt. Hopefully, will be free. When that happens, that's something that we find more really excited about. Um, but I think what happened is a small window of opportunity. The post Snowden era has raised awareness for everybody. We're going to slip back into. Everything's fine. That was the old NSA. This is the new NSA. Everything's good. Go back to sleep, right? And I think there's that, but we're starting to feel real pressure from Europe, right? And other countries, like Europe, for example, the safe harbor stuff they're doing right now, really represents a whole issue for our hosting. We host people in Europe. And so we have to rethink entirely how we do our work and what that means. So I think projects like Tor and projects like um, Let's Encrypt are great because they're independent. And there's a whole independent movement of software and of creation. And I think the degree to which we build communities, whether at, at Whittier, at UMW, and kind of support and build that, it's not going to happen. I think we forget like a lot of the culture around, say, independent music was defined in places like this, right? Whether it be through the radio station, whether it be through the ideas in the classroom, whether it be through the idea. And I think Maybe just a kind of presence of mind with that. And I'm returning those conversations to what's happening in the class about that cultural shift, whether it be let's encrypt, like are you encrypting your data? Right? When you search, where do you search? Do you realize that everyone has access to that? Do you know how something like basic as a Google search works? Like that's really like critical stuff. And that's the whole platform of digital literacy that I didn't mention that all of this lays on top of. So I think like that's the beginning. I think if we can start like why I'm trying to marry stuff like edgy punk and India tech on top of that is I think oftentimes tech becomes this monolithic, shiny, incon inconceivable space, right? And I think the difference with punk or whatever would be the idea was with people like me, do it. Build your alternative system, create it. It's actually not rocket science. It doesn't matter if you're very good at it, right? Create the community to build around it. And so that's the kind of part of that analogy that for me has been true in the work we've done. And I think it's hopeful because if students aren't here to be in a laboratory of sorts to build and create and figure that out, where will they be? Right? These formative years are essential for that. And building tech into our curriculum broadly, but not as like a, I remember when we had, I'm sorry, I didn't know I let you talk. When we had tech training at Mary Washington in 2004, when I first got there, you know what it was? Can you use Microsoft, Excel, and PowerPoint? <laughs> that was the tech training. People came through, they would stress about it. I don't really know how to do these formulas in Microsoft. And it was like, wow, like, that was our conception not very long ago about what tech and curriculum was. We have a real opportunity right now to rethink that from the ground up. And something like, privacy, surveillance, would be a cornerstone of thinking through a curriculum like that. 
Like, what is Tor? I bet you if you ask you know, a wide range of uh, students on this campus, you know, there'd be a wide range of responses. <coughs> and many of them wouldn't even know it's an option. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because there's a movement. There's the Indie, Indie, Indie Web Camp is a movement going on right now. It started up in Portland and San Francisco. And it's a whole community of people who are looking for an alternative to the Silicon Valley network, right? That it all has to be predetermined by a series of different companies, but actually you can build and maintain your own space. And for them, the common denominator amongst what they do is everybody owning their own domain. So it's very interesting how we have these two parallel communities thinking very similar things right now in tech. And I think of it as an alternative tech movement. Um, and I like to think that what we're trying to do with places like video and beyond is build that on the ground. You know? And the thing is, is, it doesn't have to be like the band. Right? It doesn't have to be, it's not a monoculture of alternative. Right? It's a unique, hopefully localized vision. And that's to me, I'm excited to think about what we're talking about. Okay, I'm sorry, what else? Other ideas? We did very Yes. Sorry. I just okay. So you have built communities that are people just uh, hold together for the years thereafter. That's a lot of things, right? Um, but how is it? What would you say? How is it that you build a community? Or not you, but what yeah. creates that? Because you're talking about that local community, bands, people identifying with it. What is the